bacteria? No, oh, fiddle sparks. This isn't right. It looks like I'm in an alternate universe? You must have been sent here for the sponsorship. This video is sponsored by Kobold Press. Oh yeah, I know Kobold Press. They created Tales of the Valiant, previously known as Project Black Flag. That's the system I was made with. So you weren't created with 5th edition D&D? Well, not technically. Tales of the Valiant builds on the 5th edition Creative Commons. The goal is to streamline 5e and build an independent foundation that everyone can create for irrevocably. Oh yeah, they've been passing their playtest documents around. Yeah, those are some previews of just some of the content being workshopped for the two books coming to Kickstarter next month, The Player Guide and The Monster Vault. I don't mean to be rude, but you look a little different from the wisteria that I'm used to. I have a few questions. Fire away! I can't use that spell again till tomorrow anyway, so I've got nothing but time. Well, let's start with the obvious. You have pretty long ears, so you're not gnomish like my wisteria? Gnomish? Oh gosh, no, I'm an elf. And for a really good reason too. Not just because there aren't any gnomes in the playtest documents. It looks like Kobold Press is using a lineage and heritage system instead of race and subrace. So every character has a lineage, which is related to their hereditary traits, and a heritage, which is more about how they were raised. Yeah! My lineage is elf, thus the ears, and stuff like my lifespan, walking speed, and ability to see in the dark. And I was raised in the cloud elf community, which gives me my cloud heritage. It's a civilization of thriving academic communities, all focused on magic. That's why I started studying the arcane. Wait, not because your family invented a famous magical energy cider and then pressured you into pursuing a course of study that you're actually terrible at in order to uphold the family name? Wow. Your wisteria sounds like kind of a mess. Yeah. Now, one interesting thing is the packet says that the cloud and grove heritages are most common amongst elves, but not that they're actually limited to elves. Does that mean a non-elf can have the cloud heritage? Or that you could have one of the heritages listed under human or dwarf? That's right. No matter what your lineage is, if you have the cloud heritage, you can learn a few spells and have basic training in arcana, just like me. And if you have the grove heritage, you can communicate with animals and you'll be really good at climbing. That's very different from 5e. There's no way you could create a dwarf character and just give them the wood elf subrace. But isn't that also kinda like backgrounds? You could definitely have a dwarf character with, say, the Outlander background. Tales of the Valiant has backgrounds too, but they're less about how you were raised and more about what choices you've made in your life, what kinds of crafts or skills you've pursued. My heritage means that I was raised in the Cloud Elf community, but my background says that I chose to be a scholar. Seems like the scholar background lets you have some relevant skill and tool proficiencies, determines some of your starting equipment, and gives you something called a talent, and let's come back to that in a second. But first, I noticed that where the 5th edition player's handbook has rolling tables for traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws, this document just has one rolling table for adventuring motivation. For me, it's that adventuring allows me to do my own hands-on research. Testing out experimental spells is kind of frowned upon in an academic setting, turns out, but out in the world I can try out whatever I want, and nobody tells me, Apple Dackle, stop turning the toilet water into yogurt. Don't get me wrong, I think adding an adventuring motivation section is a great idea, but I really do hope that they end up bringing in something at least similar to the traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws too. I find them to be a really helpful baseline to return to whenever you're not sure how your character would react to any given situation. Yeah, that's fair enough. Hey, can I use your bathroom? Not if you're gonna turn the toilet water into yogurt. Okay, back to this talents thing. They're basically feats, right? More or less, except everybody gets one along with their background. I picked school specialization, so I can be extra good at evocation spells. They're cheaper and faster for me to learn, and I get a plus one to my spell attack modifier and spell save DC for spells in that school. I love that. I usually give my players a feat at level one, just because I think they're neat. Also, just like feats in 5e, you can choose to take a new talent instead of an ability score increase. So you're studying magic, you specialize in evocation, is it safe to assume that just like my wisteria, you are a wizard? Sure am, and the wizard class entails of the Valiant is really similar to the class in 5e. There are a few small changes, like the class feature Magic Sense, which means I can basically cast Detect Magic a limited number of times without using a spell slot. Also, you have no weapons proficiencies? Nope, but I get a dagger 
anyway, for some reason. What about your subclass? I know that you have a specialty in evocation, so are you a school of evocation wizard like my universe's wisteria? No, my arcane tradition is called Cantrip Adept. Kobold Press first introduced it in their Tome of Heroes book as a subclass for 5e. It makes cantrips more powerful for me. I can learn more of them, I can deal more damage with them, I can even cast them as bonus actions a few times a day. Man, I think that's a really creative subclass. There's really nothing comparable in the core 5th edition rules. Is spellcasting more or less the same then? There are a few changes, but they're more in the interest of clarifying the system than actually changing how it works. For example, spell levels are called spell rings and illustrated with a series of nested circles, which makes it clearer that you can use a more powerful spell slot to cast a lower level spell if you want because it's contained within the ring you're using. Also, instead of spells having a ritual tag, rituals are considered a different type of spell. Any spell with a casting time longer than a minute is a ritual, and you don't have to use a spell slot to cast it. Interesting. I can see that they've added a rituals column to the wizard class table, showing how many rituals you know at each level. Also, instead of each class having a spell list, there are four spell circles. Arcane, Divine, Primordial, and Weird. So instead of having a list of spells for clerics and a list of spells for paladins, both of those classes would just use the Divine spell circle. Okay, I think I understand. They've taken the 5th edition rules from the Creative Commons and then made adjustments to sort of streamline the system and to add in some of their own flavor. The result is Tales of the Valiant. And not only will Kobold Press be created creating content for that system going forward, but it'll also be a totally open license, so anyone can create for it if they want. Right! Obviously, it's not finished yet, but they're launching a Kickstarter next month to fund the first two books, The Player's Guide and The Monster Vault. In the meantime, they're collecting community feedback on various playtest documents, and even doing live playtests at Gen Con this year. There's a link in the description where you can sign up to be notified when the Kickstarter goes live. Who are you talking to? Don't worry about it. Hey, I have one more question. You said you can't cast that spell again until tomorrow. You're not planning on staying here overnight, are you? Please. I promise I won't do anything weird with your toilet water. It worries me that I don't know what you consider to be weird 